comes right before Jesus' disciples start marveling at the great temple and the buildings surrounding the temple complex. Now while the temple was supposed to be a place where people connected with God and the divine equality we all share in God, it became instead a reminder of the disparity between the haves and the have-nots, like all things in this world. The temple was built by kings, starting with King Solomon. And while it was destroyed by enemy kingdoms, it got rebuilt again following the, the Israelite return to uh, Israel from exile. But during the rule of the puppet king Herod, who himself wasn't even Jewish by birth, but was Syrian, but by his rule, Herod the Great uh, built a great expansion of the original temple. What was just basically a large stone box that was kind of ornate and had an inner uh, sanctuary where the altar and sacrifices took place, he took that and blew it up by a thousand. And he built an entire complex with a whole bunch of different courts. The most outermost court was the court of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles could come and hang out and be a part of worship life without offending the Jews by going into their holy of holies. So you had the court of Gentiles, slightly in from that was the court of women, you can see where they placed women in that day and age. And then in from that was where the, uh, the men and the Jews could go and worship. And then inside, the, or inside that court there was, a, was the actual temple where the, only the priests could enter and offer the sacrifices, uh, for they were the only ones fit to do so. So, Herod built this, and he did it because he wanted it to become a great tourist attraction, and he predicted that if he built this great and awesome temple complex, it would draw people from all nations and kingdoms to come see it. Not a bad, not a bad idea. And of course, the people who come to see it are bringing what with them? Money, that's right. Money makes the world go round. Herod expanded the temple, again, to include several outer courts, and he also, in it, included a huge marketplace where travelers who didn't have animals with them, obviously, could purchase animals, and they could exchange their money. So if you were uh, from Ethiopia, you could exchange it for the temple, uh, temple currency, and if you were leaving the temple, you could exchange the temple currency back to the currency you used uh, in, in, in that area. So, so it was a money exchange, it was a bank, it was a marketplace, and it was a temple. This expansion started before Jesus' birth, and was nearing completion long after his death. In fact, the temple got destroyed before it actually became, became completed. So long after Herod's death, long after Jesus' death, construction on this great temple is still taking place. So this is something that the disciples would have no doubt marveled at as they saw the changes taking place, just like we marvel at the Freedom Tower being built or, or any one of the great building projects that go on in our day and age. Herod became known as the Great not because he was a guy you wanted your daughter to date. Um, he, he wasn't a great guy but because of his building campaigns, because of the temple, for, for one, but he also built, uh, in northern Israel uh, and, and in uh, the Syrian area, he built uh, uh, entire cities, like the city of Caesarea, which was dedicated to Caesar Augustus and became a great import and, uh, and port town. He, his son, Herod Antipas, tried to follow in his footsteps by building up Lake Galilee and turning that into a tourist attraction, which you can imagine then why the fishermen were struggling so much in Jesus' day, and why they had to pay a tax on everything around the Lake of Galilee. They were turning that into a, a tourist attraction, much like they want to do at the uh, National Water Gap, um, Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. This is common stuff today, it was common stuff back then. Immediately preceding Jesus' disciples of the temple, we see Jesus comparing a rich tither 
A tithe is somebody who gives 10% of all they have to the Lord. So we see this person coming to the temple, he gives 10% of everything he has, which is a lot. And Jesus compares him to a woman giving a mere two coins. Now, it doesn't say whether the rich man himself was putting the woman down, but you can imagine somebody who's giving all of this money versus the two coins. Who is the temple going to cater to more? Rich guy. Rich guy. It happens in churches to this day, right? But if so-and-so leaves, if I say something to so-and-so and they leave, then half of our, our income goes out the door with them. So again, money makes the world, makes religion, makes everything else go around. So Jesus compares the two. The one who probably feels pretty good about what he just tied, and the one whom he thinks he's better than because he's giving so much more. Jesus says, well, let's look at that. Who actually gave more? This person has all of the resources in the world and only gives 10%. This woman has two coins to her name, and she gave every last bit of it. So in reality, though monetarily the one was giving more, the woman gave more because she gave everything. And this is what Jesus does. Now you can imagine... This is not making the temple priest feel so good. It's not making the guy who just tied uh, feel so good. Maybe making the woman who gave the last two points feel good, though I wonder how she's going to eat the next day. We see, again, the disparity between the wealthy and the poor. Again, the rich man thought he was great for being a tither, but Jesus quickly points out that he actually gave less than the woman who literally gave every last bit she had. Yet who was helping her? Who was caring for her? Where were the pious and the righteous people in giving to her rather than expecting her to give to them? Where were they? We can go in the Old Testament and find it littered with, with commands from God to take care of the widow, to take care of the orphan, orphan, to take care of the people who are poor and struggling, to not allow abuse to happen in the community, to welcome in strangers. Where are these people who are allowing this poor woman to give every last penny she has? Where are they? It is as if Jesus is prepping his disciples for the inevitable question. The inevitable question that's going to follow in the next chapter. Who built that? Who built this great temple? Who built this great building? Who built that? Who built, Jesus is asking, who built a system that cares more for its rules and regulations, for its ornaments and decorations? Who built a, sin, a system that cares more for its buildings than the people who filled them? A system that cares more for its coffers than it does for the people who line them. Who built that? Who built a house so high up that no one but those able to fly can reach it? Jesus' response, as we will see next week, is this. Not God. God didn't build this. This isn't God's right here. Jesus also is known for saying to the, to the priests who question him about the temple. He says, tear this temple down and in three days I'll rise it up again. And they took it to mean the literal temple. But Jesus was talking about himself, his body. Because this literal temple is not God's. This temple is God's. So Jesus is asking the question, who built that? And he's answering it. God did. God, on the other hand, did build both the rich man and the woman and created them equal. Yet there's one with everything, giving only a tenth, and the other with nothing, giving every last bit of resources she could use to stay alive away. The corrupted get caught up in the things of this world. They get caught up in their buildings. 
their rules and regulations, in their piety and in their self-righteousness. They get caught up in all of the things that, in the end, don't really matter that much. I could go on to a Facebook post, you know, they get caught up in Starbucks coffee cups, and they get caught up in all of the silly things that mean absolutely nothing. Do you think God cares what Starbucks puts on their coffee cups? Do you think God's insulted if they took Christmas trees and ornaments off of them? People. No. Those things will, like Herod's temple, be destroyed in the end. But true faith in God, which is the greatest temple of all, will never, ever be destroyed. Who built that? You bet God did. And what God builds lasts forever. Let us, my brothers and sisters, be founded on the rock of such faith. Let us not get caught up in trivial pursuits. Let us get caught up in lies and in the life that comes through our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious and loving God, we, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for the example of the saints that came before us, the ones who gave it all to show us what it means to give it all. Lord, help us to be a people that follow true life and true faith rather than people that get caught up in the mundane, trivial pursuits of this world. Let us be a people who care about people rather than policy. A people that care about lives rather than luxury. A people that care about your word rather than our will. Lord, we are here, your humble servants. Continue to build us up into your living temples and into living sacrifices, pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.